We're here to visit with Mary Juno on my take of VoiceOver Studio Travelog. Yeah, when it comes to being successful in voiceover, I think that there's certain things that need to be considered. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thank you for calling Cricket Wireless. Our phone number has changed. What might we know your voice from? Commercials, they do video games, uh, telephone stuff. I'm actually the non-broadcast voice for AT&T. If you call Nationwide Directory Assistance, you'll hear my voice if you're looking for information and don't have the internets. Video games, I'm doing a lot of video games right now. Impossible! I refuse to believe she now leads the Horde. Not after all they did to our people during the war. I'm playing a character called Illyria Windrunner in uh, World of Warcraft, and she is a badass and it's really awesome and I'm enjoying that a lot. What would you say to someone who has some experience, good training and demos, when they're looking to get signed with an agent? You really have to have your stuff together. Do you know why you want an agent? If you do know why, and if you even have gotten to the point where you know which agencies you're interested in, have you decided kind of where you fit into their picture? You know, are there 20 of you already on their roster? I, I talk to a lot of talent who have, you know, work with great agencies, uh, you know, both on East and West Coast. And a common issue that I tend to hear is a lot of talent tend to get uh, kind of pigeonholed and they're like, oh, I keep getting all these commercial auditions, but nobody's giving me the opportunity to show off that I'm a great character actress and I really want to do animation and, you know, but they're only working with an agent that just works in that one department and, the, and they're just not getting a chance to really show the full spectrum of who they are as an actor or even grow, you know, who they are as an actor by getting the work, you know, in the first place or the, the auditions. William Morris um, has been a great agency to work for. I've been very fortunate in that Cody and Eric and Sinan, they have all just been very willing to just throw things at me from you know commercials to, I, I think I've even had trailer auditions to ADR, um, you know, promo, you name it. They give me a shot, you know, and I, they've been kind enough to give me really good feedback about my versatility and so they keep giving me more opportunities, but I hear that that's not necessarily a common thing. So I've been really, really, really pleased with that. A lot of talent really don't have a strong identity. You know, branding is challenging, trying to figure out, you know, who do I wanna be? Who do I sound like? What do I come across as? And what am I good at? Once you've done all the legwork and shown that you're serious as a business person, you know why you want this agency and you know what you're looking for in your career. Talk to talent on the rosters that you're interested in and ask them, you know, what coaches do they like? If you can't get access to the agent themselves, you know, say, are you know, do they tend to like a certain coach? You know, work with those coaches, you know, work with the people that the agents respect. And then, you know, if that that coach is willing to maybe eventually speak on your behalf, that's gonna get you way more leverage than just writing and saying, you know, hey, people say I'm pretty awesome. What was that impetus? that made you want to move into the world of voiceover. What I had liked about radio so much, it was like, okay, I get to talk for a living and listen to music and make friends all day. Like, this is a job, hello, sign me up. That really was the first time I was in love with what I did. I, I thought I was one of these people who was just gonna be a serial, you know, career seeker. Um, I was always miserable at the, the jobs I had before. You know, I've been like, uh, I take that back. My very first job, I was a uh, bookseller at a little place called Books A Million. It's actually a chain down south, so you may not have heard it, but it's pretty much a equivalent to Barnes & Noble or Borders, something like that. Um, so I loved that. I was like, this is great, minimum wage, and I get to read books and I get an employee discount. So that was awesome. I've also been like an assistant legal secretary. I've managed warehouses. I've been a purchasing agent. I've been an inventory control supervisor. And so up until I found radio, I, I, I didn't think I was going to like anything. I did radio for about... I want to say maybe about seven and a half years, maybe eight years tops. I kind of had, had gotten to the point where I realized like, I, I'm just not growing anymore. I was working on three stations at once. You know, I would do mornings, 
on our classic rock station. Then I would switch right over and start doing middays on our country station. Then I would do evenings on our adult contemporary station. The only station we had left, we had a cluster of four stations. That the last one we had was ESPN. And I was just like, I'm not doing sports. Although ironically, I'm now working with ESPN, go figure. But uh, anyway, yeah, back in that, at that point, you know, it was like, you're either growing or you're dying, you know? So I knew I wasn't moving forward. It's time to do something else, but I had no idea what and that's when i started considering voiceover thanks to good old google i was like how can i use my voice for a living again you know and and not go back to school because i was kind of thinking well now i gotta go get a degree or, or something i've got to have another trade you know because i really like this talking for a living stuff so i'm gonna go to school for broadcasting and 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 whatever you know um but didn't happen that way i, I wound up just taking the time I would have spent in going back to school and the money I would have spent going back to school. And I started doing my own research. I started buying books on voiceover, you know, because I started realizing I could, I can still talk for a living. This could work, right? I, can, I have a microphone. I can do this. And so, yeah, that's long story. That's kind of how I wound up leaving. It was just kind of like, I, you know, I knew it was time, you know, when you know, you know. <laughs> well, you obviously found what you do. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's, yeah, to say the least. I mean, it to go from, yeah, a, a lifetime of thinking I was kind of never going to find my home and to finding voiceover, it was just kind of like, you know, I didn't know I was holding my breath, but then suddenly it was just like, yeah, no, this is it. So I can act and you don't have to know who I am and I can just be anybody and it doesn't matter what I look like and I can sound like whoever I want and I can just create these characters with my mind. Like, hell yeah. So, you know, so... It was a no-brainer, but it really wasn't something that occurred to me, even though when I was like three, four years old, I used to constantly nag my dad and I'd say, you know, I want to talk on the recording. Let's talk on the recording. And we had this tape player and he'd take out the tape player, you know, and I would just, I just wanted to talk with him, you know, so anything I could do to, you know, we would, you know, read poetry, you know, my name, addresses in the phone book, you know, Aesop's Fables was a big thing. I'm just, I just wanted to tell stories into the recording. Never connected the dots and thought that somehow one day... Are you guys going to be a problem? Because we could have just kept walking. Tell us a little bit about how what you do to research and develop a character for a video game or some animation. Well, hopefully this uh, answer is not going to tick any purists off because I never really did a lot of formal training. I just kind of have a different, more organic approach that's always just kind of worked for me. I, I've since then, you know, studied different methods, nothing too terribly formal as far as, you know, extensive workshops or anything. But I just found that for me, um, what I do is I, I've always loved people. I've always studied people. Growing up, I wasn't the most popular kid in school. I dealt with bullying and things like that. And when I was going through tough times during that time, I was it, it forced me to try to understand people, why people do the things that they do, why are people mean to other people? And it just forced me to, to try to just really pay attention. You know, am I doing something? Are they hurting? Why would they do those sort of things? And I just, it kind of became an obsession. I just really got interested in people's motivations by default. And I know that's kind of how, what acting essentially is, is, is finding a, a, a motivation, a human, motivation a, a, an archetype something that universally speaks to us all you know something you know e emotions experience that's kind of what i do when it comes to character work you know i always find that there's usually no matter how bizarre the character may be drawn or you know what environment they're living in you look for those common threads that connect us all right you know like we all love our children and we all you know, care about the state of the world and we all want, you know, things to get better, right? You know, there's just things that all connect us as human beings. And you, if you look hard enough at the characters, you can find those things. Um, and it's great when you have visuals too, of course. Visuals make, you know, kick things up a notch so much more because right off the bat, you know, you see how someone looks, you kind of get an idea of their quirkiness or, you know, maybe it's an age thing that you need to adjust or, um, but as far as just their attitude and emotion, you know, you, you kind of see the scenario as far as what the specs say, who they are. And sometimes we don't get a lot of info. Sometimes they just, they'll tell you an age, um, maybe their, uh, their job title, um, and kind of where they are right now. And you may not even know where that is, you know, as far as researching that. So you kind of have to 
draw from there. So if they give you any clues about, you know, she's been through a war or, you know, then you realize, okay, how can I tap into that sense of resilience or struggle or pain? Or, you know, maybe my voice is going to be a little grittier because I, I'm, I'm having a rough time right now and I'm tired. You know, this, this character has been on a long journey and, you know, she's not going to be some young per perky bubbly thing. And then I just try to find where I might be in my mind, you know, if I was that person, if that makes any sense. And I just try to shift myself into those shoes. And that's kind of my unofficial technique, as it were. I kind of just call it channeling, really. Okay, let's ask that question. All right. Do you prefer competing or cooperating? I definitely prefer cooperating. That's one thing I love about voiceover is that it doesn't feel competitive, like on camera. I'm kind of spoiled now to this voiceover community. It's the most generous community that I've ever seen. I've been in cases like this where I, I booked an audition and I realized, you know, in the beginning of the process or even midway through, like I'm probably not the best talent for this, but I know at least two other gals who would nail this. And I have no problem passing that along. And people have done that for me. And I just don't hear of other industries like that where we're just so, comfortable with just being like, you know what, I want to help, you know, the client at the end of the day get what they want. And if I'm not what they're looking for or not the best fit, but I know, you know, a friend who could use this and might be a better fit, it just, it's, it's very common in our, our community to do that. So, um, yeah, I enjoy that. So what attributes does someone need to be really successful in voiceover? Discipline. You can't sit back and just wait for an agent or a manager to do all the work for you. You have to train. You have to be up to date with what is the current sound. You have to be directable and you have to know what that means. You know, there's a lot of terms when it comes to being directable, you know, like when a director says, you know, can you make that a little brighter? You have to figure out what those sort of things mean. You have to be comfortable selling yourself. I find so many amazing talent who career-wise should be so much further ahead. And the reason that they're not, I feel, is because of one simple thing. They're not comfortable promoting themselves. <laughs> We've got a cat fight happening right now. <laughs> studio cat fight going down. It's about to be National Geographic up in here. <laughs> Rhea, don't mess with my interview. On her face, she's like, yeah, she's like, was I can see it. Her tail's just like, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was funny. Okay. That was funny. Whatever, whatever somebody said, let's, okay, they're making peace. <laughs> you were saying about the person who doesn't know how to sell themselves. Yes. Um, there are so many talent who have no problem getting copy in front of them and selling the hell out of someone else's product. But when it comes to selling themselves, I go to their website or, you know, I, I try to ask them about their brand and they just don't know, or they diminish themselves. You know, they put themselves out in a way that at the end of the day, you have to ask yourself, imagine you're, you're a buyer for a top fortune 500 company. Would you, in this day and age, with our technology having the ability to look at thousands of choices, i.e. the competition, by Googling, you know, female voice talent or male voice talent, and that sea of names that's going to show up, if you look at what you're putting out there, would you buy you? And you have to really honestly look at that, look at the competition. And if you can't say yes to that, then that's your first problem. If you wouldn't be interested enough to pick you first and you can't say you would take a chance on you next to the next guy, that's where you need to start. Request your copy of the Fresh Favor Collection today, which includes Joel's three message series and a 100 page book, Live in God's Favor. One of the most popular televangelists in the country, um, is, his name is Joel Osteen. Uh, I am his branding voice um, on television and radio Sirius XM and phone systems and all that. He was, you know, doing auditions. I got a direct invitation to audition and I saw it in my inbox. A million other things were going on. I was busy prioritizing actual gigs and stuff for my agents and I wound up missing the audition. Didn't think anything of it. Um, come to find out, Joel's team uh, then went to my website, tried to get my phone number. Somehow there was some typo on my phone number, couldn't reach me there either. I should have probably lost it at that point. <laughs> but then I think got in touch with my manager um, and then finally was able to get in touch with me and uh, sent me an email and was just like, you know, hey, I'm so sorry. 
to bother you, but we just wanted to know, um, my, my boss, the producer said, my boss is really, out of all the people he's auditioned, you were the one where he put five stars by. So if you don't want to audition or whatever, could you just let us know? And it's like, oh, well, who's your boss? <laughs> It's like Joel Osteen. I'm like, oh, it's, it's, it's only my mother's favorite, you know, like, I don't know if you call him preacher, minister, televangelist, but all of all time. It's a really kind of powerful full circle thing for me. Um, my mother years ago almost died um, of a very aggressive cancer. She was given I think a few months to live. She didn't even tell us about it at the time because, you know, she was really scared. Um, and she didn't know what was going to happen. And interestingly enough, Joel Osteen's mother had gone through something similar where she had gotten really ill and she was given, I think, a 5% chance to live. She was only supposed to live, I think, a matter of a few months as well, or a few weeks. Um, it was really, really bad. I mean, she wound up being emaciated and her, I think her skin was like jaundiced and it got really bad. And, uh, she wound up telling her recovery story. Uh, what she wound up doing to get better was she had gotten so, if I'm recalling telling this story uh, correctly, she had gotten so physically ill and everything, just looking at herself in the mirror, you know, she just felt like she kind of looked like walking death. So, you know, she knew the power of faith and belief and visualization and all that. And she just wanted to kind of align her vision to heal herself with an idea of health. But looking in the mirror, she didn't know how to make that happen. Um, so she just would paste pictures of herself when she was healthy all over the house So she could just look at that and she would say I am healthy and, and strong and whatever and you know through a lot of you know positive thinking and faith and, and, and prayer She's been recovered now for I, I think even a couple of decades now um, but she unbeknownst to me at the time was the one person who got my mother through her story inspired my mother enough to hold on and and believe that she too might be able to beat this with you know faith and prayer and hope and she never gave up and she just you know vehemently you know held on to uh her name is Dodie Osteen she held on to Miss Dodie's story um so this was all unbeknownst to me so fast forward to years later I wind up working becoming the voice of Joel which my mother already thinks is cool Joel winds up coming to New Orleans, which is where we were living in greater New Orleans at the time. Um, my mother was a couple hours away, but I made sure that I got, I, I was going to get a backstage pass to finally get to meet Joel in person to meet the producers I've been working with. Um, and, and he offered a ticket for my mother as well. So I was like, oh my God, my mother would love this. This is going to be great. So we go out there and uh, we're backstage. And my mother is talking to one of the producers and she tells the story about, you know, how thanks to Joel Osteen's mother, Dodie, you know, she's still alive to this day and you know, her story saved her life and everything. She's actually here backstage. He's like, I have to tell her. So he runs, finds her, pulls her aside and it was just like, you have to hear this woman's story. My mom and her get together. It's hugs all around, tears, everything. I walk up. I have no idea what is happening. They tell me the story. It's waterworks all around. I'm just like, you, you know, kumbaya. We're like circle of life. Like, what is happening? And it was just one of the most full circle, powerful things I'd ever experienced, you know, because I, I wasn't like an uber religious person or anything at the time. I, you know, got the position and, um, you know, but let me tell you, that was sort of a miraculous sort of connecting the dots to realize there was just something overwhelming about realizing that, you know, my employer now, you know, because of the energy and his story that he's putting out there, put his mother on a platform, which then gave my mother the inspiration to still be with me. It was just like, you know, like uh so yeah this is amazing you know every day i feel like is this happening like am i in hollywood what is happening you know so it's, just, it's a dream i do not want to end let me tell you <laughs>